Okay, thank you everybody uh, for coming to our uh, special seminar at the Department of Marine Geosciences at the University of Haifa. We're very honored to um, host Dr. Amit Levy from Harvard, United States. Uh, Dr. Levy received his PhD in geophysics and planetary science from Tel Aviv University when he was studying gas hydrates in the solar system while doing research for the Smithsonian Institution in the United States. Following his PhD, he became a Harvard Fellow and later a postdoctoral fellow at Harvard Astronomy Department, working for the Origins of Life initiative and focusing on the possibility of habitability of ocean worlds. Currently, he is a research associate at Harvard working for the Origins of Life initiative. He is interested in the macro and microscopic nature of atmosphere outgassing from for the case of ocean worlds in icy moons. <coughs> so today, uh, Dr. Levy will talk about the habit habitability prospect in ocean worlds. So thank you very much, Amit, and we're looking forward to hearing you. So thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you for the introduction. So uh, I hope you'll find this talk interesting and somewhat intriguing while I am working for a group that's looking for extraterrestrial life. It's always nice to start with, to give this the proper perspective. Um, so when, I'm sorry, I'm just, uh, okay. Slides are not me. Oh, okay. <laughs> So when we talk about ocean worlds, it's, it's, it's good to remember that it really refers to a spectrum of bodies in our solar system and beyond. So for example, some people would consider Earth as an ocean world. Clearly, you, most of the surface is covered by water. Um, an interesting example from our solar system uh, would be Enceladus. Uh, Enceladus is a, is a moon that has a global ocean seen here and in, in his section in the middle. In the middle plane, in the middle pane, and it has uh, the global ocean is underlined by a um, a rocky surface with interesting water rock interactions. Another interesting example from an ocean world, also from our own solar system, is a body that would look like Titan, uh, where you have a subterranean ocean that is sandwiched between two ice layers, uh, an external crust and then an internal high pressure ice layer that is separating the subterranean ocean from the rocky interior. So clearly all of these are actually considered ocean worlds and um, they all would have very extreme, interesting sort of chemistry going on that we're interested in studying. Um, but also we are discovering more and more planets beyond our own solar system thousands of planets now. And we can measure the mass of the planet and the radius of the planet, which would give us an idea of the density, the bulk density of the planet. And the aim is also to study the atmospheres of these planets. And what we see here is some representation of the planets that we are discovering. All these dots, they're just basically a whole landscape of planets. And we also see compositional um, compositional plots. So for example, planets that fall along this um, orange uh, curve have Earth-like composition. This is Earth, this is Venus, and then this compositional curve means that half of the mass of the planet is water. And we see that a lot of the um, dots actually fall along this in this region. So we actually are seeing a lot of planets out there that have substantial quantities of water. Uh, and they seem to be falling at relatively high masses. So they're more massive than, than Earth, but they're not as massive as Neptune. So we can call them mini Neptunes. And if they don't have a lot of hydrogen or helium in their atmosphere, we call them ocean worlds. But we also think that there is an observational bias that we don't see really well very small planets. So we consider Earth to be a very small planet. And if we had uh, seen a lot of planets in this region, we would see that a lot of planets in this region as well could potentially have a lot of water in their uh, uh, interior, a lot more than what Earth would have. The reason for that is if you think about how planets form, then 
you can you can you can envision that as you have a proton and then you have a disk of material surrounding that proton and if you're close enough you're hot enough and the material that really condenses is rocks and metals is silicates and metals and you would get a planet that looks like earth but the farther away you get from the proton you start condensing ice and then you get more ice into the material that forms the planets and the planet my mother uh, used to talk uh, with me Excuse me? Oh, is someone talking to me? I think someone just didn't have their, oh, their, okay. their mic on mute. If everyone could I'm put sorry. their mics on mute. Okay. So if you form farther away from the sun in beyond the region, what we call the snow line, water condenses and a lot of water gets into the planetesimals that form uh, planet, forms planets. And People have run these sort of models for planetary evolution and planetary formation for various types of stars. And what we see is that around very low mass stars, stars that are less massive than our own sun, when you look at synthesis of what planets form, a lot of the low mass planets that form are predicted to have substantial quantities of water. So, and these low mass stars are very abundant in the galaxy. So what does that mean? Well, what it really means is that both in our solar system and beyond, oceans are basically everywhere. They're everywhere. And they are a very, very interesting prospect for an environment to study for, you know, in, in, in terms of habitability and astrobiology. But there is another reason why um, oceans are very intriguing in terms of habitability, especially oceans in our own solar system. Uh, we know a lot about you know, uh, research being conducted looking for life on Mars, but actually there is a lot of material transported between Earth and Mars, a lot of biological material. In fact, we could all be Martians. And however, that's not the case for uh, the icy moons of our solar system. And there is a big drive to look for life, to, to study the habitability concept of life in, in, in the ocean worlds, in the icy moons of our solar system, because if we actually find life there, we would have a completely independent life evolving from Earth. It's independent from Earth, and it would be two instances of life formation in our own solar system. This would actually mean that there is, that would be a very substantial step forward in proving that life is a cosmic phenomenon rather than something that's unique to Earth. So ocean worlds in our solar system and in general are very, very interesting um, uh, places to look for life. Now, uh, I talked about the spectrum of ocean worlds and it's a very wide spectrum. And for the rest of this talk, I actually wanna talk about, I wanna concentrate, I wanna focus on a very particular type of ocean planet, the one that resembles uh, Titan. And this would be a very interesting, very, very extreme sort of scenario, very, very different than, than Earth in a sense, because you would have a very, you would have uh, a lot of water. You can imagine, for example, an Earth with, an other, with another Earth mass of water. And then you could have a global ocean. And then this, this planet has so much water that just due to the high pressure exerted at the bottom of this ocean, before you actually reach rock, you form a layer of high pressure ice. Now, when I say high pressure ice, what I actually mean is because of all the other edits Added, um, added chemicals. I talk about things that you probably are very much aware of, like gas hydrates and maybe, maybe other structures such as filled ices and salty ices that actually form within this high pressure ice that is underlying such a global ocean. And really, if we are interested in probing the habitability of these oceans and we're interested in, pro in probing what sort of atmospheres are outgassed and form around these type of planets because this is what our observational tools are looking for, mass radius and the composition of the atmosphere of various exoplanets and ocean worlds in this case. When we, we can build a, a model for pure water, so we introduce a lot of interesting molecules that are molecules and various ionic species that are of interest to life. And that introduces a, a plethora of uh, 
of uh, crystals that such as gas hydrates and filled ices. And I will mention uh, gas hydrates a few times throughout this talk. And it actually is easy for me here because I think that uh, I don't have to talk a lot about that in a, in a school for marine sciences. Uh, so you probably all heard uh, hundreds of talks about um, gas hydrates, but basically if you haven't, so these are these crystal structures that can form due to uh, interaction of water with hydrophobic molecules. And they're stabilized to relatively um, uh, moderate pressures, not moderate pressures in terms of Earth's ocean, but in, in general, one to two gigapascal is relatively moderate comparing the uh, pressure scale in, in the interior of the planet. And a lot of the times when we study exoplanets and we study these extreme ocean worlds, we have a lot of data that's missing. And uh, a lot of the data about you know, aqueous solutions at very high pressures, how do they behave? And one of the things that I do uh, takes most of my time nowadays is basically collect this computation, co collect this data using computational chemistry, where we basically run molecular simulations and we, uh, you know, let those run and do their thing. And then we do statistical analysis. And then we use that data in order to get all various chemical data about the aqueous solutions that we're interested in. What we see here is methane with water, for example, at very high pressure. Okay, so this was kind of a general introduction. And what I wanna do right now is I wanna talk specifically about uh, various issues in the habitability of, uh, of ocean worlds. And one of the, one of the key um, criticisms that people have raised um, about the habitability of ocean worlds is that if, if you have an, a planet that has so much water and has no uh, continents um, popping up at the surface, then it has no silicate weathering mechanism. And that mechanism stabilizes the climate on Earth. So probably these planets don't have a stable climate. And if that's the case, then maybe they're not habitable just because they're not stable. And I think it's interesting to, to remember that when we talk about these, you know, extreme environments, extreme, these could be very, uh, uh, very abundant environments in the galaxy, but we have to really think that they may have their own mechanisms of perhaps stabilizing the climate. So how would exchange of CO2 if uh, may act to stabilize the climate in an, in an ocean world? This is an interesting question. If, if you don't have continents and you don't have silicate weathering as we uh, know it from Earth, then how, how uh, what sort of interaction would CO2 have in, in, in ocean worlds? So the first thing that um, is interesting to look at is the water CO2 phase diagram. So this would be the pressure scale and you go into the planet uh, in this direction upward and the temperature. And this would be where water is liquid. And this shaded region is basically where uh, gas hydrates are stable uh, with a water-rich uh, liquid. Gas hydrates of CO2 in this case would be stable with a liquid that's very rich in CO2 as well. And as you go up in the pressure, basically you go into the planet, you can reach the, the seafloor of this planet, which in this case would be composed of, as I said before, you have enough water in this planet. So you'd have a high pressure ice layer. And it's not unreasonable, cosmochemically speaking, the surface, the, the bottom surface of this, of this planet would actually be composed of gas hydrates or other uh, sort of these structures that I've, I've mentioned before. And one of the things that you probably know about gas hydrates is that they impose a, a strict condition on how much CO2 needs to be dissolved in the ocean for them to be stable, right? They have a saturation condition that they impose in the ocean. You don't have enough of that CO2 dissolved in the ocean, basically the gas hydrate would dissolve into the ocean and release that CO2 as we see, for example, for methane hydrates at, in, in Earth's ocean. And these gas hydrates of CO2 are actually very, very dense. Unlike methane hydrates that are, have a very low density, gas hydrates of CO2 are very, very dense. And if you put a, a block of gas hydrate somewhere here in the, in the ocean, it would actually sink to the bottom of the ocean. That is, uh, 
it, yeah, so it would sink to the bottom of the ocean. If that is the case, if you had an ocean where it's very, very deep ocean, it could be tens of kilometers in depth, and you had a seafloor that's composed of gas hydrates of CO2 that impose a strict restriction on CO2 saturation in the ocean, how would CO2 uh, fluxes look like um, between the atmosphere and the ocean? Well, there are two general ways um, uh, that you would consider such a flux, and that is that um, you could have a wind-driven circulation that would exchange CO2 between the deep ocean and the atmosphere by mixing the ocean. And if there is an ice cap, then that could perhaps be an interesting mechanism for reacting with the CO2 in the atmosphere. So let's look at these two mechanisms and see how they would behave. So people have done research into uh, uh, winds and wind patterns if, if Earth, for example, had no continents, how would uh, wind patterns look like? And then how would, for example, uh, the wind patterns would affect the convergence and divergence in the upper ocean? And it was found, well, not unreasonably so, that uh, you would have up regions of, of upwelling ocean of, 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 uh, in, the, in the tropics and downwelling in the subtropics, and then again, upwelling in the, in the subpolar region. So let's take this sort of model and think about wind-driven circulation in this sort of very, very deep ocean where the wind can mix perhaps the upper few kilometers, but then you have tens more of kilometers until you reach the bottom of the ocean. So again, you would have CO2 in the atmospheres of these planets, and the CO2 would become dissolved in the subtropics. And then because the subtropics would still be a region where ocean water can converge and downwell, then uh, parcels of liquid water in, uh, uh, with um, dissolved CO2 can basically be pushed inward in Ekman pumping. And um, basically, um, as they reach uh, the bottom of the wind-driven circulation, they can interact via eddy diffusion. And if there's more CO2 dissolved in the deep ocean, they, become, they can become enriched in CO2. And then as they upwell in the subtropics where surface water diverge, they can basically release that CO2 in, back into the atmosphere. And we can figure out the flux of CO2 as, between the difference between the, the CO2 that goes in the subtropics and the CO2 that comes out at the tropics. And if we do that, then what we actually fi uh, find, uh, uh, quite understandably so, is that um, the uh, pressure of CO2 in the atmosphere in steady state would basically mean that the wind-driven circulation is equilibrated uh, with the atmosphere, the levels of CO2 in the atmosphere with those uh, of the saturated deep ocean. And what that would mean that depending on the temperature of the deep ocean, you would end up with tens of bars of CO2. The, the reason you end up with so much CO2 is that, remember, the condition is such that the bottom, uh, the seafloor of, the, of this deep ocean is, in this case, assumed to be composed of gas hydrates. And these gas hydrates impose a lot of CO2 or uh, discharge a lot of CO2 into the ocean. So you end up with atmospheres of tens of bars of CO2. And the question now becomes, OK, so if indeed you uh, have so much CO2 in the atmosphere, uh, what would happen if you had an ice cap? And this is really interesting. And, and we have to, to ask ourselves, what uh, do experiments tell us would happen if you have tens of bars of CO2 in the atmosphere and you would have an ice cap floating at the surface of the ocean at low pressure? And what experiments tell us is that high CO2 pressures can actually drive the formation of gas hydrate. So you don't have enough CO2 in Earth's atmosphere to actually convert um, uh, sea ice on Earth into gas hydrate. But if you have a planet that pumps a lot of CO2 into the atmosphere, that actually becomes a really interesting uh, sort of mechanism where the, the sea ice can transform into gas hydrate. And we always have to think about these unique 
sort of situations when we're thinking about planets that really don't behave uh, much like Earth. And as I've said before, gas hydrates of CO2, unlike methane hydrates, are very, very dense. So what would actually happen is that if the wind-driven circulation would pump a lot of CO2 into the atmosphere, a lot of that CO2 can actually start con uh, converting the ice cap into gas hydrates of CO2 that then becomes really, really dense. And we can figure out after uh, what is the critical density that they need, how much of, of the ice needs to convert into gas hydrate between and before the entire ice um, uh, cap becomes really gravitationally unstable and, and parts of it start sinking just because it's so massive. And we can, because all mechanisms would work simultaneously, both the wind-driven circulation and the ice cap, then we can write this sort of equation for how does the, uh, the abundance or the atmospheric pressure of CO2 in the atmosphere changes with time, considering that you have this wind-driven circulation and the ice cap mechanism for basically uh, uh, being transferred into gas hydrates and, and acting as a mechanism for sinking of atmospheric CO2. And what we find is that we, we get this very interesting sort of result that when we look at the atmospheric pressure of CO2 relative to the temperature of the ice cap, we actually see that there are regions where the gradient is negative. So there is a, a negative correlation between the CO2 pressure in the atmosphere and the temperature of the ice cap. This is really interesting because what it really means is that there is a possibility for a negative feedback mechanism that has nothing to do with the silicate weathering mechanism, right? If you had an ice cap that tried to warm up, then basically CO2 would be sucked into the interior of the planet, trying to cool it down by basically sucking in uh, and sedimenting into the planet um, um, a greenhouse gas and the other way around. If the, if the ice cap tried to cool, then right, if the ice cap tried to cool, then more CO2 would be pumped into the atmosphere, more CO2, more greenhouse effect, and then basically further heating. So there is a mechanism that wants to stabilize um, the ice cap on these planets that are basically ocean worlds. They're completely covered with an ocean and they may have this possibility where if there is an ice cap, this ice cap may be stable. Now, this is really, really important from the point of view of thinking about habitability, not just because it may create a situation where the climate is stable, but an ice cap has really interesting features. One, it, it allows for freeze-thaw cycles, which are very important from a prebiotic chemistry perspective. And within the pores of the ice cap, I will, I will return to this point um, um, in, in uh, the next few slides, in the pores of the ice cap, you can create enhanced concentrations due to eutectic freezing, which are again, very important from a prebiotic perspective. So, so these plants with an ice cap really serve as a really interesting uh, prospect for, for habitability in planets we're actually looking for. Uh, yeah, uh, so uh, the, the reason why um, uh, uh, these um, uh, increased concentrations within the ice pores are important, as I've just mentioned, is because um, life or the emergence of life in an ocean is, is, is very, it, it has a, a unique problem. It has a problem that basically it, it, the, the environment is diluted. Right. Everything is capped. Basically, all the concentrations of all materials are basically capped by the maximum amount, which is how much matter can dissolve in the water. And the problem prebiotically is that it's just not enough. Um, and, and, and that's a serious problem. When you're trying to run experiments in the lab for uh, conducting prebiotic chemistry, if the concentrations of material in the ocean is just not enough, you're not gonna get your amino acids, uh, nucleic um, uh, acid bases, that's a big problem. But in the ice caps, uh, that may be relieved somewhat if basically during freezing at low pressure, material is absorbed into pores and their concentration increases. So as again, so, so the ice cap is really important, both in terms from climate stability and in terms of um, uh, mitigating this dilution problem. 
So, uh, and I, I will uh, return to, to, this, to this issue um, again towards the end of this talk. I wanna uh, jump to another uh, critical problem we have in studying exoplanets and uh, ocean worlds in terms of, from, in terms of the uh, habitability prospects of ocean worlds. So again, when we talk about habitability prospects, we want to understand from the point of view of what we know about prebiotic chemistry and the evolution of life, um, we wanna know basic things like, for example, what is the salinity? What is the pH of the environment? How would we go about to study these things for something that, well, in Earth, we can actually go out, we can take a sample. How would you do that for, uh, for an ocean planet? So the interesting point is that, so, I, so how, would you, how would you actually uh, uh, get an idea of what the salinity and pH would be? And we can solve for um, the planets, for exoplanets, we can solve, we can uh, uh, build models for uh, the thermal evolution and heat transport in the interior of a planet. So for example, what you would see here is uh, an ocean. So this would be your, your global ocean. And then uh, at some point, these are high pressure ice melting curves. You would go into high pressure ice. And then we can solve for the thermal profile in the interior of the planet. And it's, it's maybe not uh, very um, uh, easy to discern from this particular figure, but you can see that um, uh, there is a region when, when you solve for the thermal uh, evolution and thermal models in the interior of, um, of such a planet, you see that at the seafloor, the seafloor is actually pretty much constrained to the melting curve of high pressure ice. What does that mean? If, if we look at this sort of cartoon, uh, you can think about an ocean, and then as you go deeper into the ocean, you reach very high pressures where water freezes, just due to the high pressure, and you form high pressure ice layer, a boundary layer. And underneath this boundary layer, this thermal boundary layer, there is convection going on. And this convection goes on in high pressure ice. Now, the fact that the thermal boundary layer, the seafloor is confined to the melting curve of high pressure ice, what it basically means is that uh, it, you constrain the temperature gradient. Now, from basic physics, if you constrain the temperature gradient, what you are constraining is the thermal conductivity. Uh, so how much heat you can act, not the, the, the you, you constrain your ability to conduct away heat. So in these types of planets, if, if the ability to, to conductively cool through the ocean floor is constrained, what may happen is that high pressure ice uh, is can convect uh, uh, and reach the, the, the bottom of the ocean. And then basically because of the inability to conduct away uh, accretional heat and radioactive heat from the interior of the planet, it would actually discharge hot water. This high pressure ice would actually melt and discharge hot water into the interior. And in the steady state scenario, uh, cold ocean water would actually solidify. So basically what may happen in these types of uh, very bizarre planets that we see out there is that there is a mechanism where high pressure ice melts and there is a solidification. So there's a melt and then solidification of cold ocean water uh, happening, uh, cycling in this planet. This melt and solidification cycle is very, very important. The reason it's very important, and it, it really helps us to understand what the salinity of these planets may be. Uh, and the reason is because there is a very big difference between uh, how um, a brine solution would act in low and high pressure. It has a very, very different behavior. We know, for example, that at low pressure, uh, when you freeze water, it tends to exolve out the, the ions and you have a liquid solution that remains very, very salty and the, the hexagonal uh, low pressure ice is relatively uh, devoid of salt. That's not the case for high pressure. At high pressure, what would happen is exactly as we see in this plot, the ions, these uh, yellow and green 
uh, balls uh, represented by these yellow and green balls here actually become basically uh, compressed into the solid. So when high pressure ice freezes, it actually entraps all the ions. But that's true for high pressure. And it's also true as long as the temperature is not too high. If the temperature gets too high, then from a thermodynamic perspective, okay, from a thermodynamic perspective uh, what happens is that um, actually these ions tend to exsolve out of the high pressure ice and form uh, pure crystals of salt, for example, halite, if you're studying, if you're looking into uh, experiments into sodium chloride. So if we go back to this thermal, uh, thermal modeling of interiors of planets, this would be the high pressure ice mantle. We certainly exceed these high temperatures. Uh, so what does that mean? So I, again, I think it's, it's easier to, to understand if you see this sort of uh, cartoonish uh, representation of what the mathematics actually tells us. But what it means is that during the smelting and solidification process, what we think may happen is that high pressure ice at high temperature uh, that is devoid of salt because of the high temperature, the salt cannot go in even at high pressure, basically reaches the seafloor and discharges water that's hot and relatively uh, uh, devoid of salts. But then at low temperature uh, and still at high pressure, where water, ocean water resolidify, they actually capture a lot of ions from the ocean. And then this is folded, there is a ductile folding, and this folds into the interior, where as the high pressure ice reaches higher temperatures, it would actually start exsolving out the ions out of the high pressure ice. And these very um, uh, dense crystals would sediment to the rocky core. So you have um, uh, material devoid of, of, of these uh, ions coming out and material very rich in these ions coming in. So the result is that what you actually have is a pump at work and how fast this pump actually works or it's, it's a pump that desalinates the ocean. So how fast a pump like this would work really depends on the mass of the ocean and the rate with which you are melting uh, high pressure ice on the one hand and resolidifying parts of the ocean on the other hand. And it also depends on the fractionation factor of salt, um, 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 hydrated um, uh, uh, salt that is uh, dissolved in water relative to how much salt can become dissolved in high pressure ice. What is the fractionation factor at high pressure? If the ocean floor is composed of uh, what we call ice seven, which is a particular form of high pressure ice that has many voids, then this mechanism acts really, really rapidly. If a different crystal structure forms, which is um, ice six, this mechanism is still working, but because of the different fractionation factor of the ions, it's working less effectively. But what we think it less effectively, but still over um, in a time scale that is far less than you know billions of years, which is the age of the planets that we are observing in our, in other solar systems. So what we think is that we end up because of this desalination pump we would actually end up with oceans that have a maximum concentration of salts that are measured in the millimolar. So it could be that these planets have very low levels of salinity. So, that, so, they could be, so these oceans could be very rich in volatiles because gas hydrates discharge their, um, their um, content into the ocean and, and make sure that uh, this, these environments um, uh, are very rich in CO2, for example, or, or methane, or various types of other uh, components that can go into gas hydrates, but they could be very poor in salt. And if that is the case, well, we can do uh, something very easy that probably uh, all of you have done before and basically have sold for the speciation of the carbonate system, assuming that um, you have a very low salinity, and this actually uh, goes around this uh, problem of carbonate alkalinity because we can't measure it. Of course, we, we're not traveling to these exoplanets, so that's, this is actually a good result. And clearly the result would be 
that if that is the case, and if you solve for these equations, and if you use, um, uh, if you remember that because the bottom of the ocean could have a lot of gas hydrates, so the CO2 levels, the freely dissolved CO2 in the ocean um, is actually constrained by equilibrium with gas hydrates. If you solve that equation, then what you actually get is that freely dissolved CO2 would be the most abundant DIC. Um, but also uh, what we find is these, that these oceans, we, uh, we speculate that these oceans basically would be very, very acidic. And that means that if life um, uh, really uh, um, exists in these types of oceans, they're probably acidophiles. And if we demarcate the, this region of low acidity and low temperature uh, on a polyextremophile plot, so what we see here in this polyextremophile plot, all these dots are basically these niches that life um, basically um, um, captured uh, and, and thrive at in various locations on Earth. But we see that in this particular region of, of high acidity and low temperature, we don't have a lot of life on Earth. It's pretty rare to find life under such conditions. And, and it could be that this is because it's a rare environment on Earth. So um, life never had to evolve substantially to occupy this particular environment. But it could also be that these are harsh conditions for life. So this is something that we have to to, to remember. But we have additional stressors because as I've said before, um, we think that there is a desalination process going on and these oceans could be relatively devoid of salt. So um, this is an interesting stressor on, on life, on the, on the habitability prospects of such planets because uh, if, if the environment is very acidic, uh, how would life survive? Well, one of the ways that, that, that life um, uh, basically survives in a very acidic environment is by uh, capturing a lot of sodium, and, and that creates a potential barrier from these free protons coming in. But how do you do that if you have very low concentrations of potassium because you are desalinating the ocean? So this again goes back to this idea that Ice caps are really, really important because perhaps within these low pressure form of ice, this ice cap that forms at the, at the upper uh, surface of the ocean, perhaps due to eutectic freezing within the pores, you can actually um, get high enough concentrations that even if the environment is acidic, high enough concentrations of, of various ions, for example, such as potassium, that even if you have um, um, the ocean at large is diluted, perhaps within these pores, you have enough um, uh, concentrations of potassium to um, counteract or, or combat these acidic environments. And so, so again, we're going back to this idea that the ice cap is very important. And really the, the final thing I wanna say is that we can actually pinpoint these planets. So this is now where it becomes really exciting because if, if we said that there is a negative feedback neck mechanism where uh, the levels of CO2 in the atmosphere are anti-correlated with the temperature of the ice cap, this is the region where an ice cap may be stable on, on these sort of planets, we can try and um, paste that together with um, um, a radiative convective model and energy balance model for, um, uh, for uh, planets around different types of stars and try and figure out whether uh, in, in what regions around different types of stars would we expect a planet to fall in this category where there could be a stable ice cap. And we have done that. And what we see here <clears throat> is that, <clears throat> sorry, <clears throat> um, these stellar effective temperature basically represents dif different types of stars. So this would be uh, our sun, for example, somewhere up here. And as we go down in this temperature scale, we basically go to planets, uh, stars, uh, stars that are less and less massive. And this effective uh, flux of incident, um, uh, uh, flux incident on the planet is basically a measure for the distance of the planet from the star. So these are really habitable zone measurements. And what we see here is that there is a relatively narrow region demarcated by this uh, blue curve 
and red curve in different types of models, that really is the region where if there was an ocean world, it may have these CO2 levels and a cold enough ice cap where this ice cap could stabilize. And the, 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 the really exciting thing is that because we see so many ocean worlds, like I've talked about in the beginning of this talk, basically ocean environments are everywhere, everywhere in the galaxy, we already are seeing a lot of exoplanets starting to fill up this, this, this gap. And we think that these planets are now uh, very interesting targets for astrobiological follow-up. Basically, we're um, facing our... Um, uh, basically facing our telescopes towards these planets, and we are gathering information on the atmospheres of these ocean, ocean worlds, trying to see what else can we learn about these planets, whether we can find out um, more about uh, their oceans and, and what sort of biosignatures, if, there are, if those are indeed biosignatures. So uh, I want to leave you with this uh, summary, which is basically oceanic environments are common in the galaxy and in our solar system. Uh, an ice cap is something that is really, really important. It helps stabilize the climate on these planets, but also it's very, very important in terms of uh, um, dealing with issues of dilution for uh, solving uh, this uh, network of prebiotic chemistry scenarios, how life would evolve. An ice cap is really important in ocean worlds. And we're discovering ocean worlds, new ocean worlds all the time. And we have a lot of missions uh, NASA is planning a lot of missions to ocean worlds in our own solar system. We have a, a mini helicopter that's going to uh, land on Titan, uh, which is really interesting. So, and, and ocean worlds in general really are an exciting prospect for habitability studies um, uh, that, is, uh, that are very unique and are different than Earth, for example, or Mars, I would say, or certainly uh, upper atmosphere of Venus. And okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Amit. It was really exciting. Thank you. Uh, this uh, talk uh, of yours about uh, uh, ocean worlds everywhere in the outside the, outside of our planet. Thank yeah. you very much. Uh, okay. I open the um, the podium for any question that we may have from the audience. I don't see all the faces, so just jump in and. Ask a question. Okay, we have a question from one of our students, Winnie. Mm -hmm. What geochemical differences exist between ocean worlds and ice worlds? Oh, so, um, so really, um, when I say ocean worlds, from from a technical perspective, we even if the if the ocean is subterranean, certainly in our solar system. Uh, we consider Enceladus and Europa and Titan. Uh, we consider all of them um, uh, ocean worlds, uh, uh, but they're farther out away from, from the sun and, and they have a, a frozen outer crust. Um, and that frozen outer crust um, interacts with the ocean um, and um, really um, um, they interact with the ocean and they modulate what sort of uh, materials um, uh, actually end up in the ocean or end up in the atmosphere. Um, but um, they're really two different. Um, uh, when you think about ocean worlds, I think you need to think about an ocean world like Enceladus in Europa, where you have a global ocean, and then there is a rocky surface, a rocky um, a, a layer uh, uh, underlying these oceans, and a lot of water rock interactions. Um, and there is hydrothermal. Uh, uh, um, there, there are there is chemistry in hydrothermal uh, vents, for example, happening in Enceladus, and we can actually measure that. So we can measure some of the outcome of that because there is there are bursts and plumes coming out of Enceladus, and we fly through these plumes and we can measure the material there. And there are planets like Titan uh, uh, bodies, or uh, uh, there is Titan, but there is the planets that resemble Titan, where you have a high pressure ice layer, and there. The chemistry uh, that you would have in the ocean is really modulated by, by what happens uh, uh, in high pressure ice. So the, the, the chemistry of high pressure ice, what sort of um, um, solubilities are allowed by high pressure ice, what sort, it, it, would re, it would act 
as somewhat of a sieve that would decide what molecules can be exchanged between the interior uh, uh, rocky um, uh, part of the planet and, and the ocean and what molecules or various entities would not. So there are these two types of scenarios. I, I hope that answers the question, if not. <laughs> yeah. I would attribute that to the early hour of the morning. <laughs> I, I think you did answer the question. Okay, thank you. Yeah, uh, more questions? Somebody? Um, I have a theoretical question. Um, do you think, in your opinion, any of these ocean worlds would be an alternative option for human hab habitat? Oh, like what they're researching in, in Mars or in other planets? I'm not sure. I mean, if you just to, just to, um, well, you know, there is, um, you know, Elon Musk talks a lot about, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> going out there to Mars, but I think that you have to, uh, I mean, I don't even think that Mars is really, I mean, people are talking about terraforming Mars, but uh, even Mars is uh, basically to terraform a planet requires so much, like, for example, People are speculating that in the um, sub subterranean surface of uh, Mars, there are a lot of uh, gas hydrates of CO2. So for example, where a lot of the CO2 in early Mars may have gone to, perhaps it went into the ground. And therefore, if we just land there and we start melting this water, we get liquid water from this subterranean ice. But at the same time, we release a lot of the CO2 so we can actually uh, basically create this nice greenhouse where at some point, if we terraformed enough of it, we can warm the surface enough and we don't have to invest a lot of energy because now it's warm enough to melt all the rest of the ice. So we'll get liquid water and we'll get CO2. So this is <clears throat> an interesting prospect, but it requires such technological advancements, I think, and so much energy. I mean, we're, we're bringing to Mars like tiny robots. This requires uh, a different scale of engineering, that if we had that, I think it would be reasonable to just live in space or even live wherever we want. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, I think it's probably would be easier for Mars, but I don't know, I, 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 don't, I don't think so. But um, these icy moons are certainly interesting if, uh, if you live out in space and you need water. <laughs> so there would be a nice uh, cool drink out there. <laughs> Can I ask a question? Yes. Um, in your modeling, uh, you um, you don't talk about sources of energy. I mean, it, it seems as if the uh, the system is driven by the uh, primary energy of formation of the planet or something like that. But but we know that planets actually have internal energy sources uh, from radioactive decay. Right. And and wouldn't this would this have an effect on your um, modeling of the, the long-term evolution history of the planet. So what I've shown are, are, are uh, as you have seen, I've shown uh, temperature profiles in the interior of the planet. Uh, for example, um, in, uh, in, uh, um, in this plot uh, here, I'm oh, sorry, in this plot here, but I'm not sharing my screen anymore. Uh, can I share my screen again? Um, yeah. Okay, sorry. Um, Okay, can you see that? Yeah. Yeah. So, for example, uh, in this particular uh, model, where you see here the the adiabatic uh, thermal profile in the interior of the planet, so um, the internal sources. So to solve for these uh, thermal um, uh, thermal profiles and the, these um, um, blue curves here, to so to get these thermal profiles, thermal temperatures, you actually need to to, uh, to account, and this is what uh, we have done, what I've done is, uh, uh, what we have done here is that you have to account for accretional heating and you have to account for radioactive heating as well. So this is uh, uh, taken into consideration. It's a very important source of, of internal energy. Of course, as the smaller the planet is, the, the, the more uh, radioactive heating is important relative to accretional heating. And 
And uh, you, you really have to take that into consideration and it has a big effect on the dynamics in the interior of, uh, of the planet. So these heat sources are indeed uh, taken into consideration. Okay. Um, more questions? <coughs> yeah, I ask some uh, question. Um, what kind of uh, what kind of information can we ocean scientists and I guess particularly deep sea ocean scientists uh, provide? that would be, that would interface with this work? Yeah, this is a really interesting, this is a really interesting question. So uh, there are two things we have to keep in mind. One is uh, we will never have earth quality data, right? These are planets far away. We, we invest a lot of time into a, a lot of work, a lot of money into building this equipment that will really look for the for every kind of molecule in the atmosphere of these planets, and um, um, but really uh, um, this is offset by the fact that we just will have a lot of these planets from a statistical perspective. We have an advantage in comparison to Earth that we just have a lot of these planets. And if we think something happens, it should happen in every type of situation according to our model. And we can test to see whether that's true or not, whereas Earth is unique in this sense. Um, but I think that um, in terms of oceanography of Earth, it really is important because we gather information on sort of what mechanisms are important. Uh, because we, we do have to sometimes build these more simplified models just because we, we don't have this level of information that you have for Earth. We sometimes have to build these, these models. We do need to try and figure out what, um, what mechanisms are more important than others. Why does Earth's ocean um, look the way it is? Why, what, why uh, is its composition? Why these ions and not others? Uh, are there robust mechanisms that that control uh, the the composition, for example, and are there other mechanisms we can, for example, neglect in 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 our study of exoplanets? And then, if this mechanism is more robust, then maybe we can use that and try to figure out how would that mechanism work in these alien environments, and would it work? And then, if that is the case, then what can we say about these planets? So it's it's kind of this um, uh, double-edged sword in a sense. It's then you have to remember that on the one hand, we'll never have the same level of information. So we can't really just take, um, um, you know, the complexity of, of the models for, that you build for Earth and implement them directly. But on the other hand, we, we have to learn from you guys what are sort of the robust things that are the most important things to look at and then try and see whether those would work under various really alien environments that exist, not just everywhere, but every type of environment exists. So you can change the water content in any way you think, and we will probably have these planets, right? You can have Earth with 10% uh, more water or you know, twice the, 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 the amount of water or 100 times more, and we will see these planets. So this really is the, the sort of sort of information that a lot of times when I talk with people in, in the earth sciences, um, this is the sort of information that, I, that, I'm, uh, uh, that I'm looking for. What are sort of the robust things that I need to consider to, to really try and understand how the, our planet works and how would that affect the atmosphere? That, that's a key issue. How would that affect the atmosphere? Because that is going to be our main observable. The, the other question is what about oxygen? You, you, you did talk about climate stability, and so you focused on the CO two, but you said nothing about about you said nothing about oxygen. How do you envision the oxygen content of those oceans? Actually, this is a really interesting question because oxygen is a prime biosignature. 
So when we're thinking about, look at, we're looking at these planets, we're thinking about, for example, oxygen in the ocean, but oxygen in Earth's atmosphere is related to life. So, um, so O2 automatically is um, something that we're looking for. And whenever we see oxygen in the atmosphere of an exoplanet, everybody gets excited. And we're thinking this, this planet gets upscaled in the, in, in the scale of uh, potential habitability. <clears throat> so oxygen is a really interesting story. If you have a planet that has a lot of water, and for example, it is around an active star, one of the things that we find is that um, one of the things that we find is that water vapor gets dissociated, uh, photo, photo dissociated in the atmosphere uh, because of high activity of some of the stars that we're looking at. And the hydrogen, which is very light, escapes into space. So you actually end up with planets with massive amounts of oxygen in their atmospheres. And this gets dissolved in the ocean. So one of the things that, uh, this is uh, work I haven't published yet, but one of the things I've been looking at is what, ha what's, what happens to oxygen um, as it reacts with water and ice under high pressure, uh, which you, at, at the pressures you would expect for, for the planets that I've been, I've been working on. But the same mechanism, for example, would work if you had like, if you, uh, if you, had, if you had less water. I mean, if you, even if you had like a rocky surface and you push the planet further in and you know, a lot of the water gets into the atmosphere, you, you, and you, you, you'd photo dissociate a lot of the water vapor anyway and end up with a lot of oxygen in the atmosphere. But what I think happens is that a lot of the O2, you can, you can, um, <clears throat> you can calculate using computational chemistry the, um, the partitioning coefficient of O2 between the ocean and the, and the ice. And one of the things that you, you see from these calculations, I actually haven't published this work yet, but you can see that the, the partitioning coefficients is such that you may end up with quite a lot of O2 in the ocean. You can live without photosynthesis. Um, because your surface is so icy, it's difficult to, to get the photosynthesis working. Um, you, you need some sort of um, electron exchange redox sort of reaction to, to where that, that life could use to, yeah, as an energy source. And there are various um, um, suggestions for that. For example, um, oxygen and, and, and uh, its um, um, dissociation in the magnetic field of, uh, um, of, um, of Saturn is one thing that people are, are suggesting as a redox sort of um, um, uh, a redox chemical reaction that life could use to maybe survive on Titan. But um, yeah, I mean, I, I don't. I'm not sure that O2 enough is uh, O2 alone is enough. But in any case, we, we don't consider O2 alone as a biosignature. Uh, you need some more, as you can see. That we, one of the things that we we have a problem in exoplanets is that sometimes if a, if something is a biosignature on Earth, it's not necessarily a biosignature on another planet, because it just forms due to the natural geochemical reactions forming on this planet. This is one of the things that we always struggle with is basically figuring out in these alien environments uh, what in Earth's atmosphere that we attribute to life uh, would actually form naturally on another planet and is actually not a biosignature. <laughs> so this is a big problem that we're struggling. So the thing right now is that the, the, the general idea now is that we're looking for, for a suit of molecules. Uh, it's not a particular, so we're just not looking just for O2, we're looking really for sort of um, metastable compositions. So for example, O2 and then methane, for example. If you could, if you could see O2 and methane, that would be a better biosignature.
um, because it would, if, if, if life didn't help methane into the atmosphere, then that methane would likely oxidize. So we're looking for these metastable uh, atmospheric states. And we have to couple them with the interior of the planet, with the interior geochemistry of the planet to figure out what would come from the interior and what would, so it's a, it's a complex problem, as you can see. I have a follow-up question on that. Yeah. Uh, uh, in the evolution of Earth, uh, I don't think that photodissociation uh, contribute to the oxygen uh, atmosphere. I don't know, I think that not, but only to the, I would say, removal of some water molecules from, from, from Earth. So can you use this uh, to assess whether this photodissociation photo could contribute to the to to oxygen in the oceans? Uh, again, you mean um, you you mean for these exoplanets, what would contribute? Uh, or uh, maybe I misunderstood. You mean uh, would this photodissociation contribute oxygen to these alien oceans? Um, yeah, it would contribute a lot. Um, you could get a lot of O2. So this photo dissociation, especially, especially around, so, so low mass stars are the most abundant stars in the galaxy. So actually our sun is not that common. It's not that there are not other stars that resemble our sun, but most of the stars in the galaxy have a low mass and they're called M dwarfs. And these particular stars are actually very active. The, the initial 1 billion years of their life is very, very, they're very active from, from, the, from the point of view of, uh, of their, um, of their um, emission. So, but they're very active. Actually, planets that form around these stars, the, most of the planets that we observe are actually mm -hmm. form around these, uh, around these stars. Mm -hmm. And these planets could go through a billion years of massive photo dissociation. And some of the modeling, including my own, uh, would suggest that you could end up with hundreds of bars of O2 in the atmosphere. And you could figure out that you could have quite a lot of O2 in the ocean uh, because of that. So yeah, I mean, these are, these are weird, envi weird environments. <laughs> and that O2 is just stable. It's, it's, it's heavy and it's not going anywhere. And the hydrogen just certainly, certainly around low mass stars, you, you tend to have low mass planets. So unlike Saturn or, or Jupiter, where you would just hold on to your hydrogen, these around low mass stars, these low mass planets would tend to, this hydrogen would just go poof and you would end up with a lot of O2 in the atmosphere. Yeah. Okay, <clears throat> thank you very much. I think um, we need to close because it's uh, a little bit too, too late already. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I have thank to you. take my kid to daycare, so that's... <laughs> <laughs> that's uh, much more important. Yeah. So, so uh, thank you very much, Ami. Thank you. And, um, thank you for... If if you questions. want, we could add you to the list of seminars on our department. Uh, I'm sorry, I didn't hear your question. If questions. you want, we can keep you in our list of uh, advertisement for our seminars in our department. Sure, sounds great. Great, fantastic. Okay, so cool. have a good day over there. We will have a good evening over here. You too, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. <laughs> thank, you. thank you very much. Thank you. Bye.